In tonight's lecture, I'd like to talk to you about ancient Aegean art. Now, unlike previous cultures that we've studied so far, those were kind of landlocked, especially those in the Middle East. However, now we're dealing with a civilization that relies completely on the sea. These were tremendous seafaring individuals. This culture that we're going to look at, the Aegean civilization, flourishes in three distinct areas of the Mediterranean. The Cycladic Islands, which are off the coast of present-day Greece, the island of Crete, which is just south of the Cycladic Islands, and then mainland Greece. And this is the Mycenaean culture. So this is pretty much what we're going to be looking at. And this is kind of a transition period going from Stone Age into the Bronze Age. And the Bronze Age begins around 2500 BC. This is where also this is the Neolithic Age, but this is also where we start to learn how to cast bronze. So we've got our three civilizations and you can see that we're looking at roughly from 3000 BC down to about 1500 BC. And at that time, we have some major changes that are going on in the world. Um, we have a lot of earthquakes, we have volcanic activity in this region. And so we see a lot of these cultures just kind of in very, very abruptly. When we come back to this area of the world in the next chapter, this is going to be the true Greek civilization after we go through the Dark Ages from roughly 1200 BC to around 776 when we start to have the Olympic Games again emerge in Greece. So here's our area of the world we're looking at. Of course we have mainland Greece here and recognizable cities such as Athens and Sparta. We have the Cycladic Islands here and then down below this large island is the island of Crete. So I'm just going to show you some of the early artwork and artifacts from this era. Uh, we have some Neolithic structures. Of course, they are very ephemeral, so none of these really exist today. But we've also got some really cool pottery, ceramics that do. Now in the Aegean civilization, religion is completely different than we saw in the last chapter in Egypt, right? With Egypt, we had a very polytheistic culture. There were many different gods. However, of course, during the reign of Akhenaten through Tutankhamun, we have that monotheistic culture. And then after the death of Tutankhamun, we go back to a polytheistic one. But here we have a civilization where religion doesn't seem to play much of any part in life. We don't have any temples where people would pray to gods. We don't have any religious artifacts to speak of. I'll show you maybe one that people argue that it is, but you know, it's very doubtful. Now, when we look at the civilizations from the Cycladic Islands in Crete, uh, the Minoans, and also um, the Cycladic people, they're very, very peaceful. But when we move to mainland Greece, those Mycenaeans, you can't trust them. They are going to be particularly aggressive. So let's look at some of the artwork from the Cycladic Islands. And you are familiar with a few of these. Of course, the most famous one today is Santorini. But back in ancient civilizations, this would have been the island of Terra. And most likely, this was an island torn apart by a volcanic eruption. Now, one really good book to read uh, that I will plug for you is called Unearthing Atlantis. And the author of the book, uh, Pellegrino, argues that this may be the mythical land of Atlantis. And he goes back and talks about all the wonderful things that happened in this area and how this culture just ended so abruptly with that volcanic eruption. But if you'd like to read, that's a fantastic book. Again, it's called Unearthing Atlantis, and it's by Charles Pellegrino. 
So on these islands, we find these wonderful cycladic figures. And what's exciting is this is the first artwork we're looking at where these figures are made out of marble. They're so cool. And the reason they're made out of marble is it is a naturally occurring material in the ground here. So uh, with the marble sculptures, they're of course easy to carve because they are a soft stone. Now when we look at these cycladic figures, we see that they are very abstract. And that term isn't going to be used really appropriately until about the 20th century. But abstraction just means that we're taking organic elements, making them geometric, taking curvilinear line, moving it into rectilinear line. But with these figures here, we definitely have some geometric forms to them they would never be seen standing up like they are here. In fact, you can see with the image at the left, has its toes pointed down. So it could never stand on its own. These were meant very much as these figures here that we found in Ein Ghazal that were associated with graves, that were lying on top of graves or in the very top layer of soil of the graves as if marking them or perhaps giving uh, homage to the people who were buried there. They would have been painted, they would have had hair with them as well, and you also have to be very, very careful because these are the most faked of artworks from this region and this time period. So a lot of what you'll see on the market are fakes. And these also perhaps inspired those early modernist artists like Brancusi, who you see his work at the right there. Some wonderful harp players. Look how individualized the one at the left is. Again, these were found associated with graves. And we also here have some negative space. And remember with the Egyptians, we used a lot of diorite or anathorsite to make those sculptures. Well, here the marble is very, very soft. So we have some positive area, but we have a lot of negative area too for the harp, underneath the chair, and so these are really well-created sculptures. In fact, the ones, in fact, both of them look as if the person is having his head tilted back as if he's singing or just really enjoying the music. We've also got some really cool pottery from this region. We'll take a look at some of the varieties later on, but these are so exquisite and these were found throughout the Mediterranean even as far away as Russia. So now let's move down to the island of Crete. All right, so here we are down here at the island of Crete now. And Crete itself is really associated with the Cycladic Islands, but it's much larger than any of them. It's about 150 miles in terms of length from left to right. And then in width from north to south, it's about 30 to 36 miles. There's a little bit of a close-up of the island and the different cities. We're mostly concerned over here with the palace at Knossos. Now, the people who lived on this island are somewhat of a mystery. In fact, scholars are not really sure what happened to them when their society ended abruptly. Again, this could have been anything from volcanic eruptions to earthquakes and finally conquests because I'll show you a work later on from the Mycenaean culture, which is definitely made by a Minoan artist. So there's some arguments that these Mycenaeans came over and conquered the island, but also there could have been just some immigration from the island to the mainland. It's Sir Arthur Evans who is the discoverer of the palace at Knossos. And the palace itself covers about six acres worth of land. It's a pretty big site. And this would have been just an amazing location back in the day. Now this is also what I would consider a second palace because it is built on some foundation of an already existing building. This new palace would have been bigger and better. It would have had a tremendous amount of light and air circulation. There's even some arguments or some theories that 
this place actually had plumbing. Most of it was constructed of mud brick, which we see in a lot of the earlier civilizations, but these would have also been dressed, so they would have been extremely beautiful to see. But it's also the first time we see this veneer or facade on exterior walls. And also what's really great is these columns that you see are made out of wood. And of course, with m wood and mud brick, they're going to give a lot better during an earthquake than a lot of the other materials would have. And I'm just going to show you some of the ruins and also some ideas of what this would have looked like under reconstruction. And also notice how these columns taper from a larger diameter at the top down to a smaller diameter at the base. And we'll definitely be looking at a lot of columns in our next chapter when we look at Greek architecture. What you'll notice also here is that we have some artwork right directly on the walls. And these are fresco paintings. And I'm going to be telling you about these because this is where we see the very first fresco ever created. It dates back to around 1400 BC. And it is just this really cool image of this person jumping over a bull. And so we call this bull jumping or the Toreador fresco. Not a whole lot of it remains. Um, a lot of this is artist reconstruction. But you can see these darker elements here. Those are all original. And then these lighter elements, this is an artist reconstruction. So a Toreador fresco here is perhaps showing us a rite of passage of a youth kind of jumping over this bull. And bulls on the island of Crete are sacred. In fact, we also have the story of the Minotaur from this island as well. Some people uh, make some different arguments for this work as well, whether this is one person, a second person holding the horns, and a third person catching the individual, or this might be the same person. But I tend to think it's three different people myself. This is what it would have looked like in its original state. Probably about three feet in height, six feet in width. And we see this throughout all sorts of different types of art from the island. And in fact, the later artwork that I'm going to show you that was done by a Minoan artist on the mainland also contains a bull. I do want to tell you a little bit about fresco as well. So fresco, the term itself is really Italian. It's not even Aegean but it's during the Italian Renaissance where really we tie in this type of style of painting uh, with this name. Fresco just means fresh in Italian. And this refers to the plaster that is used to first coat the wall. So about an hour before you would start to work as a painter, you would have hired a frescoist to prepare the wall that you're going to paint. And then during like the Italian Renaissance, you're going to have what's called a spolvero or a cartoon. This is a full-sized, full-scale drawing of what you're going to be painting on the wall or on the ceiling, wherever the plaster is applied. So once the image is transferred, then you're going to fill in the outlines and you're going to emulsify your pigments, which are basically different minerals into lime water, and then you're going to paint into the wet plaster. What's cool is once the plaster dries, the paint and pigment become part of the wall or ceiling as you know, and it's going to last as long as that structure does. So fresco painting is normally performed during the warmer months of the year, usually during the summer and that way the plaster will dry correctly. You've got about 8 to 12 hours to work before that plaster dries. 
It's also best, like any other time, to paint from the top down in order to prevent dripping on already completed parts of the work. Unfortunately, not all pigments and minerals are going to be water soluble, so we do have a limited color palette when dealing with fresco paintings. And finally, fresco painting is slow, it's methodical, it's boring. A full-size figure is going to take you two days to paint, and that's moving quickly. You know, later on when you're taking a Survey 2 class, and we'll talk about like the Sistine Chapel, you're looking at Michelangelo spending four years during his youth painting that. And when we look at the altar wall, he's a much older man when he paints that. He's like in his late 50s or early 60s. It takes him six years to paint that. So it's a very, very slow process. And of course, we need to be careful. Fresco painting, especially during the Renaissance, we have documentation of artists who fell off scaffolding, um, even Michelangelo, and this is the altar wall of the Sistine Chapel at the left, he fell off the scaffolding when he was working on it. Unfortunately, we also have other artists, such as Barna de Siena, who fell to his death off of the scaffolding. And one other term I'd like to introduce to you right now is called fresco seco. And fresco seco is where we're painting on dried plaster. Some reasons you would do that, basically if you're up against a deadline when traditional fresco painting would not have been applicable, uh, if you make a mistake, instead of chipping out some plaster, reapplying it and repainting it, it's much easier to paint over. But you got to figure that it's going to be nowhere near as permanent as true fresco painting. Which is why when we look at a painting like The Last Supper by Da Vinci, you know, only about 20% of the paint from this work remains. And it is in a horrible state of disrepair, but this is really the best it's ever going to look. It's gone through at least 20 years of restoration work, and that's within the last 30 years. But of course, Da Vinci was not trained in fresco painting. He was not hired to do a fresco painting. There was no deception going on here. This was pure. He got a job to paint a very large oil painting mural in the refectory of the Santa Maria della Grazia, which is where you see this painting. So let's go ahead and go back to the palace at Knossos. Uh, I'll show you a few more images. And of course, this is also where we have the legend of the Minotaur. And maybe perhaps some of it was because it was a palace built on top of ruins of another palace. But it was said that there was a labyrinth underneath this. And this is where the home of the Minotaur was. King Minos, who was the king of Crete, required the mainland to send him 14 youths every year as sacrifice. Well, King Aegeus from the mainland had had enough of it, and he decides to send his own son with this last party, and his son Theseus, I believe his name is, killed the Minotaur as the son was sailing home he was supposed to have changed the color of the flag. So when his dad would see the flag of the ship coming in, he would know that either his son was dead or his son was successful. But Theseus forgot to change the flag color. The dad saw that it was the original flag and he threw himself out of the window and died. So again, a very tragic story. And we've got some really cool, this is another fresco work from the palace. And what you might also notice here is how in tune these individuals are with nature. When we look at other works that are painted on walls, for instance, the cave paintings we saw in chapter one. In chapter two, we saw the Middle East with Ashurbanipal II killing lions. And even in the Egyptian chapter, we saw one of these individuals here on a hippopotamus hunt. When we look at the Aegean wall painting, there are no humans. There are no animals. It's all nature. It's plants. It's landscape. It's birds. 
And this is the one figure that people called a snake goddess and try to tie her into religion. Whether she is or not, we really don't know. But this was also an artwork found in one of the storerooms at the palace at Knossos. And there's other objects in these rooms as well. But we don't know who she is. She is dressed in traditional Minoan dress. But she does have like a leopard sitting on her hat. She looks very, very angry. And she also has snakes in her hand. So she's not a person who you would really want to mess with. And this is another figure from one of those storerooms. So here's an example of a Camaris Ware jar. And this is so cool. It's like from the island of Crete, and it's so technically advanced for its age, which is probably about 2000 BC. But it's got this great pour spout, a handle. It's been completely decorated, so it's aesthetically pleasing as well as functional. And it kind of looks like a football across the front here and a back on the side. But there's also a certain animalistic element here, like a bird almost. Here's the eye and the mouth and such. And it's just such a really great jar. Now, this one, the octopus flask, is something that we see time and time again in all the art history books, as well as books from the just history in general. When they talk about this time period, this is just one of those examples because you've got this, of course, seafaring civilization, and you've got this octopus, which they would have been so familiar with in the surrounding sea, and it just fits perfectly in the shape with this flask. It's almost as if the flask is see-through, and we're looking into a kind of aquarium, if you will. Now, this is by far the most common one that you're going to see, but it's also you know, utilized in different elements as well. I mean, here, especially the one at the right, that octopus is extremely abstracted. But, you know, this is just one of the subject matters that was commonly used. Probably my favorite is the harvester vase. Now, the harvester vase is one that we've, we've never found one of these intact. You know, they've all been broken. And we're starting to think that it was done ceremoniously, like after you had drink, drunk the liquid out of them. Um, this is also really cool because it's got like 27 figures around the circumference of this work. And they look like they're singing. There's a certain audible quality here. And they're going off to either some type of harvest. They're going off to some ceremony or something's happening that they're all marching to go to. This would have originally been covered in gold leaf, and it's really about the size of a shot glass. It's not very large at all. We also have early Minoan language. In fact, this would be the earliest language that we know of that is in Europe. And now we're going to move to the Greek mainland and talk about the Mycenaeans. And of course, our most famed cities, and we'll be looking at those a lot more next week when we start talking about Greek art. And here's the citadel at Mycenae. And this place is, you know, absolutely gigantic. It sits on top of a hillside, so it is a very much a military position. I told you these people were warlike. And look at this fortification wall. That fortification wall is about 20 feet thick. And it's also about 30 feet in height. And this is made out of these incredibly large, what are called cyclopean stones, because it was thought only the cyclops would have been large enough and strong enough to put these in place. I want to call your attention particularly to this area here. This is going to be the Lion's Gate. We'll take a close look at that shortly. And also over here, this is Grave Circle A, and I'll be showing you that as well. So here's some of the parts of that fortress. And the famed Lion's Gate. 
So to put things in perspective, you're looking at the lions themselves are roughly nine and a half feet tall. Their faces, they were gone because they were sculpted out of some type of precious metal. It could have been bronze, most likely it was gold. And look at that building technique as well, post and lintel system. Now as you go through the lion's gate and then head off to the right, you're going to encounter Grave Circle A. And this is where a lot of wonderful artifacts have been found because here we have what are called shaft graves. And these are dug about 20-25 feet deep into the ground. And of course right now we've got plenty of time to excavate them, but if you were a grave robber back in ancient times, you're not going to spend time digging down 20 feet to find artifacts. So we found a lot of skeletons, some pottery that was still unbroken, but we've also found a lot of gold. The funerary mask of Agamemnon, and this of course is not from the, the legendary uh, Homeric hero, but you know this is just what we call this funerary mask. We found others on the side as well, but this is made out of pure gold. And we've also found this dagger, which has a beautiful inlaid scene. So whereas shaft graves are very difficult to loot, not so for the Tholos tombs. And this would have been more for tombs of royalty. Uh, unfortunately, very easy to loot. No one has ever found anything in one of these graves. And sometimes these are called beehive graves because you can see we've got dirt mounded around it. Looks very much like a beehive. And this one is the largest tomb we've ever found of this beehive type of grave. Um, this is called the Treasury of Atreus. It is the largest uninterrupted prehistoric site uh, of uninterrupted space. So we're looking at a tomb that's basically 40 to 45 feet across on the interior. Now, the next largest uninterrupted space is going to be the Pantheon. That's going to be like 140 feet. And of course, we're using a different technology. Um, to give you also some idea of some dimensions here, this is approximately 115 feet in, width, in length and 20 feet in terms of width. Again, about 40 to 45 feet in diameter here. This is made with corbeling. Now, the next structure that's gonna be built that's gonna be larger is going to be the Pantheon, but that's gonna be made with an arch and we'll cover that when we get to Rome. But you're looking at, for the next 1300 years, that this is the best that we've been able to do for uninterrupted space. And you can see how each level is pushed a little bit inward and the weight of the structure is kind of taken off to the ground through the sides. Now this is the artwork that I was telling you that was found on the mainland but most likely from a Minoan goldsmith. When we look at the Vafio cup and it's called Vafio because it was found in the city of Vafio. Uh, this is pure gold. And you can see that the youth here that's kind of in front of us um, is tying a rope around the legs of a bull. And so again, the idea of having the bull here and a couple more on the right side uh, shows that this is most likely Minoan. And especially with the way that this is created, it's very difficult to create something in this way. This is what's called repousse, and it's going to be on your study guide. It is a type of relief sculpture. Now, relief sculpture is meant to be seen from one side, and normally it's carved. We take a block of marble, and we carve the figure out of the marble. In low relief, less than about half of the body exudes from the back of the marble. And then in high relief, the sculpture looks almost three-dimensional. I'll show you some of that as we get into like the Roman Empire. But this is repousse. And repousse is where we literally hammer metal from the backside in order to form these images. 
very difficult process, very, very rare. And of course, we're using metal that's very pliable, very soft, such as gold, such as copper. And then the last image I'm going to show you is the warrior vase. It dates down to about 1200 BC, and this is right when we're going to be heading into the Dark Ages. And I'm going to, you know, let you know this is a different Dark Age than we see after the fall of the Roman Empire. The Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, the medieval times, those are, you know, normally what we consider from around 4 or 500 AD to the beginning of the Renaissance in the late 1200s or early 1300s. Now, when we look at this Dark Age, this we could call the Greek Dark Ages. So from about 1200 BC to about 776 BC, we don't know a whole lot of what's going on here. Uh, but we do have these marching men that look like they're going off to some type of battle, and we just don't know which battle it is. Um, there is no real depth here as well. These figures are very much kind of plastered uh, on the very scene, the very surface of the pottery. So we don't really have any depth here. Uh, we kind of have that one woman at the very far left kind of waving goodbye to them. A container like this would have been used as something for mixing wine and water uh, together. It was commonly used in feasts. But some of these were also used as grave markers, and I'll show you one of those in our lecture on Greek art coming up. And so with that, that's going to end our discussion on the ancient Aegean.